Hello everyone, Dr. Mike here, TCOM 101. In this video, I want to continue my brief history of the internet, walk down the internet timeline a little bit. All I can do in this video is touch upon some of the highlights. So moving down the timeline, let's talk about the year 2001. That's when Apple introduced the iPod, the first very important portable music player that gave us a lot of opportunities to have powerful personalized music mixes and take them on the go. A couple of years later, Apple introduced the iTunes Music Store, a location online where you could purchase music. Now, let's talk about Steve Jobs, the co-founder and CEO of Apple and the former CEO of Pixar. Steve Jobs was probably the greatest business person in the first decade of the 21st century, the digital decade. Think about all of the developments that Apple gave us during the first decade of this century. The iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, incredibly important innovations, and the iTunes Store. Now, the iTunes Store was very important because Steve Jobs convinced the recording industry to sell single tracks instead of trying to sell us the entire CD. Okay? The music industry resisted that at first, but Steve Jobs convinced the music industry to sell individual tracks, and his model absolutely worked. Okay? iTunes became a huge success, okay? and iTunes changed everything, how music became distributed to the consumers, and it changed our consumption patterns, how we experience music as consumers. All right, now, in 2003, a trade association, an industry association called the Recording Industry Association of America started to sue people for file sharing, for stealing music online, for distributing copyrighted music files over peer-to-peer -peer networks. The RIAA is a very powerful organization, okay? And it sued a number of people, everything from, I believe, teenage girls to um, grandmothers for having um, unauthorized music on their computers. Okay, the industry takes this very seriously, this, this threat of online piracy. All right, moving along down the internet timeline, 2003, we saw the birth of Skype. Okay, and that really showed us that we could use the internet to make video calls. This was the first big video conferencing software. Now we have a number of options, including Zoom. Okay, but Skype paved the way for all of those video link-ups. Uh, Skype was purchased by Microsoft, the big tech giant. Okay, 2003 was an incredibly important year in the internet world because we saw the real birth of social media. Okay, the company um, that was the leader here was called MySpace. And it was really the first place that people could set up their own little profile and customize their own little page, have their space on the internet. Within a year, we saw the launch of Facebook. That was first aimed at college students, but opened up eventually to everybody. And Facebook became the dominant uh, social media platform in the United States, and later then around the entire world. Okay, a social network service is a service that uses software to build online communities of people who can connect with each other and share interest and activities and information. All right, 2005, internet usage reaches 1 billion people worldwide. That is phenomenal growth in a 10-year period when the internet first started, about 1995, to have it grow within a decade to a communication platform that's reaching a billion people across the globe. 
2005. That was the year that YouTube was founded, the birth of the world's most popular video sharing website, YouTube. Extremely successful. Okay, a great example of streaming and really the first big popular streaming service, YouTube, where just about anybody can create something and post it to share with others. Did you know Google is the owner of YouTube? In 2006, Google snapped up YouTube for about $1.65 billion. And it was one of the best purchases that Google made. YouTube, it's estimated that three or 400 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every single minute. Okay, an enormous amount of video that you could never watch. Even if you had a thousand lifetimes, you could not watch all of the video on YouTube. 2005 also saw the birth of music streaming and personalized music services. The birth of Pandora Internet Radio, the first really popular um, personalized music streaming service, which was based on something called the Music Genome Project. Quite an interesting concept, the Music Genome Project. It's a, it's a metaphor, okay, kind of it's a play on the idea of the Human Genome Project, have an understanding of the basic building blocks, the underlying DNA of human life, all right? The Music Genome Project tries to capture the essence, the DNA of music at the most fundamental level. Here's how it works. They come up with about 450 variables or attributes or characteristics to describe songs, okay? That's a deep, granular, thick, rich description of a song when you have 450 different kinds of musical variables or characteristics, everything from uh, pone to tempo. Now, take all that information and organize it using uh, complex mathematical algorithms, then you've got to a deep understanding of music, okay? And then, once you have all this information, it allows you to do the matching, to find a song and then find that you like, and then find similar songs that have the same characteristics, okay? So they could push recommendations at you based upon you know, the information gathered in the Music Genome Project. Now, this is not the biggest musical database in the world. I'll tell you about that one later in the class. It's something called Echo Nest. Anyway, Twitter comes about in 2006. See, it was the first decade we saw the growth of this century where we saw the growth of social media. Twitter is a microblogging service, okay? Short messages launched in 2006. Okay. Did you know tweets were originally shorter? They were restricted to 140 characters, but now, you know, that has been doubled to 280. You know, Twitter has changed the culture. The president makes, our president, President Trump, makes tremendous use of Twitter. He sees it as a, as a way to reach his constituents, his followers, directly without having to go through the uh, news media. Okay, that's one of the reasons that Trump uses uh, Twitter. All right. In 2007, just a few years after it started, Apple had surpassed a billion iTunes downloads. Hugely successful. Now, of course, iTunes today has a lot of competition, okay? Uh, or Apple has a lot of competition in the music world. But at one time, it was one of the dominant places where we would turn to get our music. How about 2007? That was an interesting year. That was the year that uh, we saw the birth of WikiLeaks. Maybe you've heard of WikiLeaks. This is anonymous news and information leaks. People want to leak information about the government, about big business. They want to share the secrets in the interest of keeping the public informed. Then take that information to WikiLeaks. Very controversial. It'll be a great topic for a controversial um, issue, presentation, or essay. Of course, the founder of WikiLeaks is Julian Assange. Um, 
He's currently, I think, um, facing legal problems in Great Britain. Um, I'm sure the United States officials would like to get their hands on him because WikiLeaks has been responsible for several leaks of American government information. Okay, 2007, Google Street View was launched. What an incredible database, okay, where you can actually see an image of virtually any, uh, from the street at least, of virtually any address in the world. It's an amazing database. Of course, it also raises some interesting uh, privacy concerns. You'll notice that most faces and signs and other things are blurred. Whenever you're looking at Google Street View, they do have some respect for personal privacy. Okay, 2008 was the birth of Dropbox. This is just one of the cloud-based um, hosting systems, okay? But Dropbox was important because it brought a lot of attention to the idea of cloud computing and using the cloud as a place where we could collaborate and share information together. Okay. Dropbox and cloud computing. Cloud computing is the practice of using all of these remote servers, server farms, to host all the data, whether it's the movies or uh, any information. You know, is store, you, we store a lot of our personal information on the cloud rather than storing it locally on our phones or our personal computers. It's become a giant industry and of course, Amazon, Amazon Web Services. Amazon is the leader in the cloud computing industry. And now we have to care about what's happening in China. It's going to be our major competitor in the 21st century. China's internet population is huge because of its huge population. There are more internet users in China by far than here in the United States. Okay, what about the growth of broadband, the rise of broadband? Just to show you how we're moving along here, the first few years of the internet, nobody had broadband. It was all dial-up, narrow band, using the telephone line. Okay, but eventually, starting at the turn of the century, we started to see the steady growth of broadband. Look, back 20 years ago, in 2000, only 3% of U.S. homes had anything that looked like broadband. But today, it's up uh, much higher. By 2010, it had achieved two-thirds, 66%. And today, it's in the 80s. But slow, steady growth of broadband. And this is important. Once we have broadband, we can shop. We can use the internet in much, we can stream, we can use the internet in much more effective ways. 2010, going down the internet timeline, 2010 was the birth of Instagram, another form of social media, great online photo sharing service that a lot of us use. Um, and I, maybe some of you aspire to be Instagram influencers. Did you know Facebook is the owner of Instagram? It snapped it up for a billion dollars back in 2012. So Facebook and Instagram are corporate partners. Facebook hit a big milestone in 2011 when it reached 600 million users worldwide. 600 million, a staggering number, but it's nothing by today's number of Facebook users, okay? 600 million, that's about a half a billion people. By 2019, worldwide, there were over 2.4 billion monthly active Facebook users. 2.4 billion, a huge audience. Now, when you talk about users, okay, the industry uses several metrics. They talk about monthly users, and daily users. The number of monthly users is always much larger, but still, this is a staggering number. Did you ever hear of something called Web 2.0? By um, 2010, 
we had really seen the establishment of something we could call Web 2.0. Web 1.0, think of this, Web 1.0 was us basically pulling information from the internet, news, information, entertainment, other uh, forms of pleasure we would pull from the internet. But now the second kind of version of the internet, the evolution of the internet, has given us Web 2.0 which uh, is an era in which the users are able to generate a lot of content. They not only pull content, but they can post content. You can create all kinds of content with a Facebook site, a Twitter site, your videos, your YouTube, blogs, wikis, podcasts. You have so many opportunities to express yourself. The user gets involved. So the web went from kind of information extraction to a more participatory environment. Now, what will Web 3.0 look like? I'll leave that to your imagination. I have a feeling it's going to involve a lot of artificial intelligence. But social rise of social media is hugely important um, in terms of the development of the internet and the effects of these websites on our entire society. Here's how kind of the big social media companies rank. Facebook is the big one. Now, if you look at daily active users instead of weekly or monthly users, you'll see a more realistic number. But Facebook has about 1.6 billion daily active users. Instagram, about 500 million. And Twitter, 145 million daily active users. Moving down the timeline, 2012 Snapchat started. Very important, um, became very popular help push um, augmented reality through its incredible filters. 2011 Twitch debuted. This is live streaming service. It focuses on uh, mostly video gaming, I believe, but an important development. 2016 TikTok, another short form of video app was launched. That's become a very popular, very controversial because it's uh, until recently, it was owned by the Chinese. It appears it's going to be sold to an American company named Oracle. In 2019, we saw the birth of Disney Plus, another important streaming service debuted. Um, we'll see if Disney Plus can capture a lot of the market share away from Netflix. As of now, Netflix is still the clear leader in the world of streaming, video streaming. All right, it's very clear that today the internet has really taken its place alongside all the legacy media. In fact, it's probably become much more important than all of the legacy media, including broadcast and cable TV, okay, because it has become the central means of receiving and sending out all kinds of communication and content. It's the center of a lot of things that converge right into the internet. And it's become such a hugely important part of our educational experience, our commerce, our entertainment and media lives, okay? Um, the internet. So that's a bit of the history of the internet. Um, if we look at global internet usage right now, penetration, there's about 4.5 billion internet users on the planet, and that's a penetration rate of about 58% global penetration. So a, a little more than half of the people on planet Earth have um, access and use the internet. Okay, that's all I've got in this lecture. In the next one, we're going to talk about some critical issues associated with the internet. Uh, but until then, please take care of yourself and each other, and I'll see you soon. So long.